Hi, so I went to an Arctic Monkeys concert two days ago and I still really can't hear and my voice is kind of shot, so if I sound like a dying raccoon throughout this video, apologies in advance. <laughs> Wanna be on top? So odds are, if you're watching this video, you have at least a moderate interest in some form of reality television shows, but there's probably a good chance that you've never been on one, and if you have, please comment below, I'd love to hear about it. But if you enjoy reality TV, especially reality competition shows, it's fun to imagine what you would do if you were placed in certain situations. For example, if you're a Drag Race fan, maybe you have an idea for a Snatch Game character, or if you're really into Project Runway, maybe you have an idea for a Fashion Week collection concept. But one of the most fascinating aspects of reality TV show competitions is not just how you would perform in a challenge, but how far you're willing to physically take your body. If you don't meet the criteria required by the judges, what will you do to push yourself until you do? In America's Next Top Model, a modeling reality competition hosted by Tyra Banks, this philosophical and ethical question often gets taken to the extreme. As a model, you're expected to do what you can to fit a certain aesthetic or perspective in relation to the clothes you're wearing or the product you're trying to sell. And in a modeling competition, you're subject to the whims of reality TV show producers whose only motivation at the end of the day is to make that competition entertaining to watch. If you're unfamiliar with the format of ANTM, each cycle, a crop of new, inexperienced, and aspiring models models compete each week in some kind of modeling challenge, usually a photo shoot or a runway or both. Each week the models are eliminated until Tyra and the judging panel choose a winner, it's pretty standard stuff from the outside. But if you watch the early seasons of Top Model, you'll be surprised to see how much of the judging criteria for each episode is based on things that the models can't control, or at least what they shouldn't have to. Things like their basic personality traits, what they wear to the panel, and how they speak to the judges and each other during the panel. It very much feels like you're watching grown women be treated like schoolgirls, and nothing is more emblematic of this than the makeover episodes which happen each cycle. All right, I see these bright, big, alien-esque blue eyes. But then there's this hair that's kind of So we are taking you to the next level, baby! Platinum blondes a la Nadia Auerman, who was a top model in my day. The makeover episode usually takes place somewhere between episode two and episode four. From the perspective of the viewer, you've pretty much only had one or two episodes up until this point to get to know the contestants. One is usually a casting episode that gives a more behind the scenes look at the casting process, and then the actual first episode of the cycle, which includes a challenge and an elimination. In these two episodes, the models come as they are appearance wise. Sure, they're wearing hair and makeup for the first shoot, but nothing is drastically done to modify their appearance until they hit the infamous makeover portion of the competition. The makeover is usually completely decided by Tyra and some other folks on the panel, like makeup artist Jay Manuel, and those makeover choices are typically revealed to the models at the start of the episode. And it's worth mentioning that this is a staple of every single cycle of ANTM. Aside from the original cast of the first cycle, the models always know that this is coming if they make it that far. But it always manages to produce some drama or some kind of unorthodox reaction, and I want to assess the ethics of this situation because it's really interesting to me. Let's start with a simple example. This is Katie a contestant on cycle two of America's Next Top Model. Katie was just 18 at the time that this season was filmed, and she is kind of the OG example for a model having an unpleasant reaction to their makeover. Tyra gives Katie a pixie cut, and for Katie, it definitely takes some getting used to. Help me. Help me understand. Katie's obviously 18, sometimes she'd be a little more sophomoric than the rest of us. Definitely scared right now. I feel bald. <gasps> Katie just comes across as this really sweet, innocent, I'm a little child, nurture me, comfort me, but she told me that she can cry at the drop of a hat. I look like a boy. Right now, yeah, it's a little Oliver Twist. But when they style it and it's your makeup done, it's gonna be so pretty. Now there are two clear sides of this coin, right? If Katie wants to be a model, she needs to be prepared to meet the expectations of a client who wants her to look a certain way, or in terms of the show itself, Katie would ideally want to stay on the good side of Tyra and the panel in order to succeed and get farther in the competition. But I can't help but feel for her just a little bit in this situation, especially because she sort of became the blueprint for what not to do during the makeover episode. And sure, hair grows back, but I don't think it's 
unreasonable for a change to her appearance to elicit such a strong emotion, even if she becomes comfortable with that change eventually. So let me give you a personal example. I have thick, dark brown, almost black hair. And the thing about having dark hair like this is that when it's dyed and treated, it is a lot more difficult to change to a different color than somebody who has lighter hair because bleach has to be involved. You have to bleach the whole head first and then different treatments don't take to darker hair as well. So if I were on America's Next Top Model and Tyra was like, we're going to dye your whole head blonde, would I probably do it if that was what was expected of me? Yeah, I probably would, but I probably would cry during it a little bit. One, because I cry over everything. And two, because that procedure getting done to my hair would be different than that procedure getting done to another contestant if their hair was already like a light brown or like a some version of blonde, right? Additionally, you run into the issue that not all of the makeovers are enforced fairly in the sense that some people could get their entire hair cut changed and then other contestants could get like a few inches chopped off their head. Obviously those reactions aren't going to be the same and they shouldn't be treated as such. So if a contestant sheds a couple of tears during their really transformational haircut, I don't really blame them. That's a big deal in a lot of ways. But as the makeover challenges progressed, it became a well-known point among contestants to not be branded as difficult even if they didn't agree with what Tyra chose for their new look because they did not want it to impact their status in the competition. So let's take a look at a few examples of what has happened when models took this approach because it doesn't always go well. Ow, 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 ow. I never thought getting my hair done would be such a long ordeal because I would never do this to myself. This lady, she totally butchered my hair. It looks absolutely horrendous. No one was happy with it. Everybody thought it was ridiculous looking. I'm not happy. I'm not trying to be an I'm sorry, but I'm pissed off. My hair is disgusting. My whole head hurts. My ass hurts. I sat in a chair for six hours. She stabbed me in the head with needles all day. But no, Molly, it's really pretty. It's, it's pretty if you couldn't see my hair where it meets the tracks braided into my scalp. Okay, so you just watched two examples of two white models, Molly and Brittany, each from different cycles, getting weaves in their hair. If you're unfamiliar, and you might be if you're not familiar with black hairstyles, weaves are hair extensions that are typically made for textured, thick hair because of the process in which they are sewn into the head. If you're a white woman who has never had this type of treatment done on your naturally thinner or fragile hair, this can be a rather tedious and often painful experience, and a lot of the times that it has been attempted on the show, it has not even looked good. And in these two specific cases, the weaves had to come out because the contestants were not able to properly maintain them, and that's more than fair. But they didn't want to be perceived as difficult by the panel, and so they went ahead with the procedure anyway. For the most part, it didn't affect their placement in the competition necessarily, but sometimes a makeover can be so drastic that it does hinder a competitor's performance. For example, this is Michelle Dayton from Cycle 4. Michelle was given a bleach blonde makeover, but the process of using that amount of bleach in such a short amount of time on somebody who was naturally brunette was extremely painful. You can see in the clip that her legs are literally shaking while they're trying to get this done. Not only was the initial procedure difficult, but more problems began to develop for Michelle as a result of this makeover. The bleach was not properly maintained, causing it to turn more yellow and develop a texture similar to straw. And she also developed a skin infection called impetigo that the other girls were convinced was a flesh-eating bacteria. Yeah. Did you hear on the news about um, some kind of disease that eats your skin? Uh-uh. Oh, you sure? You ain't hear nothing about it? Uh-uh. Y'all just, you can get a life. My we need to get a life. <laughs> Y'all ain't got nothing to do. Read a book or something. But in reality, the makeover is actually what made Michelle more susceptible to this infection. Since the makeovers were a surprise, Michelle couldn't prepare for the bleach in the correct way because she had her hair freshly washed, which is not good when applying the bleach procedure. So when we saw during the makeover it was burning her scalp, that burning was what paved the way for the infection to become more easy to spread. This ultimately did a number on Michelle's confidence, which is unfortunate because she was such a strong competitor and she finished the season in sixth place. And I think this example is just so cruel and fucked up because Michelle did what she was supposed to do. She went through with a painful and traumatizing experience without any any complaints and still ended up getting punished for something that was ultimately production's fault. So in this scenario, you can play the game entirely correctly and still lose. And that has to be exhausting when some other girls in this season just got their hair chopped a few inches and she had to go through all of this. And of course, we have to talk about the double standards in makeover expectations across seasons. In cycle six, Danny Evans was criticized by the panel for refusing to let the dentist close a gap in her teeth. This is the exchange that took place at the panel on that day. 
So, Danielle, you went to the dentist, but you refused to have your gap closed. Do you really think you can have a CoverGirl contract with the gap in your mouth? Yeah, why not? This is all people see. It's easy to read, beautiful CoverGirl. It's not marketable. Yeah, just a little bit is okay, but I don't want to completely close it. Well, I guess she just left the gap wide open for another girl, baby. I agree. And then, a few cycles later, Tyra assigned a makeover to Chelsea, a contestant on cycle 15, to not only get her hair dyed a lighter color, but also to get the gap widened in her teeth by a dentist. So not only is this an insane ask, because if you think about it, it's technically a medical procedure that you have to consent to, but just a few years before, Tyra had been criticizing the other contestant for refusing to close the gap that she had. This one pissed off a lot of people, and for good reason, because at the end of the day, you can change your hair, but it takes a hell of a lot more effort to change your teeth. And if you look at her social media, she still has the gap. And it's not that it looks bad, she pulls it off, but refusing to get your teeth shaved down shouldn't brand you as difficult to work with, and doing it shouldn't necessarily be a commendable feat in a competition about, you know, modeling. Now before I get to the next section of the video, I do want to give some honorable mentions for some makeovers that were particularly bad. Of course, there's the infamous beard weave, Phil's Jesus hair extensions, and of course, Celicia's god-awful mushroom bowl haircut. <laughs> You're really gonna have to eat these giant Madagascar hissing cockroaches, rat hair tortilla chips, and this blood salsa filled with live maggots. <laughs> Best of luck, guys. Go, come on, Bobby, come on. Okay, so I guess Fear Factor is an extreme example here because the whole premise of the show is that contestants are doing some really unsavory shit to try and win some money, but I think a lot about how shows like Fear Factor and in some ways America's Next Top Model laid the groundwork for the level of acceptable criticism that a reality TV show contestant is allowed to face. Even in modern day shows, contestants are often criticized by the judges for not wanting it bad enough, and when you're in such a sterile and overproduced environment where the end goal is to make you the entertainment, how can that criticism even accurately reflect on you as a person at the end of the day. The producers are making this version of you that is constantly being forced to confront what you're afraid of, and it's beneficial for them if you don't react the way you're supposed to. It's very manipulative. And I even run into this moral dilemma with shows that I really like. Assuming this video might leave the typical audience, I am a big fan of an alternative drag competition show called Dragula. If you've never seen Dragula, it's a format where drag artists compete in look-based challenges, and then the bottom two or three face an extermination where they have to conquer their biggest fears. Across multiple seasons, contestants have also had to participate in body modification, like getting piercings or tattoos, and these are alternative drag artists so I guess it's no big deal to them, but permanently altering your body that way would be a big deal to me. Conversely, in season 3, one contestant was eliminated first because they did not feel comfortable jumping out of a plane, and they were ridiculed by the other contestants for not going through with the challenge. That's something I would totally do, but as someone who is a picky eater, I couldn't do the extermination challenges where they're choking down pig's blood and raw fish or whatever. What I'm saying is, fear is subjective. We all have our limits and are allowed to react and feel accordingly whether we're told we're going to encounter these obstacles ahead of time or not. And I'm also interested in what the figurative line in the sand actually is. What's the line between not wanting something bad enough and having your body autonomy and sense of self exploited? How much should you reasonably be allowed to be subjected to if you were quote unquote warned before you signed up for it? These are all questions I don't have the answers to, and while America's Next Top Model has been unpacked and revisited with a new lens of cultural analysis over the years, I do think its lasting impact in reality TV years later is pretty evident. And quite frankly, we haven't even scratched the surface. I'm 111, there's no way in hell she's 115. Like her bones are popping out, it's like she's gonna break, like no man will ever sleep with you, you can never bear kids, it's like, that's not sexy. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. You have no idea!